Hi, good morning, and welcome to Grand Rounds on this uh, typical late March or mid-March winter day. Uh, for the folks at St. Luke's, I apologize for the um, the epic-related materials. This has been a you know really a major push to get folks all trained up on epic, and um, just want to thank everyone who was involved in the training, but also all of our faculty and trainees who were on this past weekend to help us get through the transition. And um, everything I've heard is that although there were some bumps, overall was really quite successful. And I just want to thank everyone for that. We're really delighted to have Professor Sean Penny with us today, who is the Director of Heart Failure and Transplant Program at Mount Sinai, also the Fellowship Director of the Advanced Heart Failure and Transplant Program, and a Professor in Medicine and Cardiovascular Disease at Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. He got his BA and also his MD degrees from Georgetown University and then completed his residency at Deaconess Hospital in Boston, followed by a chief residency. And I guess at that point, it had transitioned to BI Deaconess and then came to New York and Columbia to complete his fellowship in cardiovascular medicine at Columbia Presbyterian, was again honored as a chief fellow. And I'm sure for all the excellence that he demonstrated both to the faculty and to his colleagues, and then did a second fellowship in congestive heart failure and transplantation at Columbia Presbyterian. Shortly following that, he joined the faculty at Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And he's really dedicated his career, his research career, his clinical career, and his teaching career to helping all of us, our patients and ourselves, understand heart failure. And in reviewing his remarkable CV, one of the things I was struck by is he's taken on the whole spectrum of disease, people with mild heart failure and trying to optimize the quality of their lives and also prevent secondary decompensation and other manifestations of the disease early on, all the way to patients at the end of their lives who are not candidates for either surgical or medical treatment and really need excellent palliation in those, in those final weeks and months of their lives. And it's remarkable to me that it's the entire spectrum that has become important to him. And I'm sure he's benefited many, many thousands of patients and, of course, all the trainees and fellow faculty that he's brought up in this important field. We're delighted to have you here today. Thank you very much for that kind invitation and kind introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here today. Uh, one of the things that I've really enjoyed doing over the last uh, two years or so is to, to come to the CCU and make rounds in the afternoon with uh, the house staff and with the fellows. It's really been a delight because the house staff here and the fellows here are so hungry to learn. It's great to engage like that at the bedside to uh, be able to take part in their education. So um, for those of you who are here for EPIC, I'm sorry, I'm going to disappoint you with a lecture on heart failure. For those who want to hear about heart failure, I'm not going to talk about EPIC, so that's a good thing. So what I, whenever I give a talk on heart failure, particularly when I talk about advanced heart failure, I want to go really back to the, to the basics and talk about um, how we take care of patients with heart failure. And keep in mind that 50% of patients who have heart failure have what we call now HEF-PEF, heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. And that could be a, a talk in and of itself, fascinating hemodynamics, fascinating pathophysiology, very few treatments that we've been able to develop to treat this. But instead, today, I'm going to focus on what we call HEF-REF, heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. This is when we talk about heart failure. And the, the key understanding about heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction is grounded in this neurohormonal hypothesis. And that neurohormonal hypothesis holds that there's some injury to the heart. It could be myocarditis, it could be a heart attack, it could be peripartum. Whatever that injury is, there's a drop in LV performance. And in response to that drop in performance, the body reacts with activation of certain neurohormonal systems, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, the sympathetic nervous system, the endothelin system. And as we're beginning to recognize now, also some of the uh, vasoactive peptides get activated as well. But the activation of these compensatory systems leads to peripheral vasoconstriction, retention of salt and water, and that preserves circulating volume, circulating blood pressure. In the short period of time, like around the time of a heart attack, that's important. It preserves organ perfusion. 
In the long term, however, it actually is detrimental because it leads to adverse myocardial remodeling. And it's the remodeled heart itself that leads to both the symptoms and the poor prognosis that's associated with heart failure at a reduced ejection fraction. Now, the good news is that understanding this hypothesis has driven drug development and has translated into significant survival benefits for patients with heart failure. And there are now several uh, uh, class one indicated therapies that are listed here in a beautiful article that was just published in Jack talking about heart failure pathways, how we can initiate and escalate therapy for patients with uh, HEFREF and HEFPEF. ACE inhibitors, ARBs, ARNEs, which are the angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitors, and Tresto is the brand name of the one that's approved, spironolactone, beta blockers. All of these are our class one level of evidence A therapies that have been able to improve survival and heart failure. Now, one thing that I would like to impress upon you is the fact that these medicines are here. They save thousands of lives every, every year, but they are underutilized. If we focus just on looking at the substitution of an ARNI for an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, you can see that if everyone who's a potential candidate for this right now in the United States were switched, you know, upshift to that therapy, we could save 28,000 lives. And if you tab uh, tabulate this, uh, this table that was produced by Greg Fonaron, you can look to the, in that column, you can see the potential number of lives that could be saved simply by following the guidelines. So the reason why I always talk about heart failure care and, is to make this point, which is that identify those patients who have HEFREF, understand what the therapies are, initiate them, and then after that, escalate them to the target doses. Okay, so let's move on to advanced heart failure. So advanced heart failure, stage D heart failure, end stage heart failure, it goes by different names, but essentially what we're talking about is a condition of heart failure, reduced ejection fraction that has now become refractory to those neurohormonal antagonists. And it's, a, it's not a clear cut line in the sand that, you know, on Tuesday you're stage C, you're symptomatic, and on Wednesday you're stage D. Rather, there's a gradual progression moving from stage C or compensated symptomatic heart failure to end stage heart failure. But there are some clues along the way that, that allow us to lump patients into stage D heart failure. And I'm going to go through some of them, but repeated hospitalizations, ICD shocks, worsening renal function, refractory symptoms, and inability to tolerate those neurohormonal antagonists are the way that we really define the symptom, uh, the syndrome. So let's talk about hospitalizations for a minute. We know that it's a bad thing to be hospitalized. We know it's a particularly bad thing to be hospitalized for heart failure. And that's because there's something that has changed in that patient's natural history that has led to the hospitalization. Now, I'm, I'm a very bad person. When my heart failure patients get admitted, I don't blame myself, I blame them. Like, you didn't do what I told you to do. You had McDonald's. You didn't take your medicines. You didn't weigh yourself. And while it's true that that does happen on occasion, human behavior would tell you that they probably do that with some frequency, but there's something different about that one episode that led them to be hospitalized. And that's because something's changing underneath. Those neurohormonal systems that I talked about, we can't really directly measure, but to me, a hospitalization for heart failure is really a reflection of the fact that the neurohormonal systems are, are overactivated. And we now know that if you have sequential hospitalizations, your mortality is even more adversely impacted. So in this slide, if you look at the impact of having three admissions for heart failure, median survival is a year. And if you have more than three admissions for heart failure, median survival is between five and seven months. We also know that chronic kidney disease interacts with heart failure, and those patients who have advancing chronic kidney disease have a worse mortality. That's probably true for anything in medicine. If you have chronic kidney disease and diabetes, heart failure, emphysema, you have a worse mortality. But here there's an interaction not only with chronic kidney disease, but also functional capacity. And you can see from this diagram that if you are unlucky enough to have stage four heart failure, so symptomatic at rest, and a GFR of less than 44, you have a 34, or your risk of mortality is about six times higher than those patients who don't have symptoms and don't have uh, CKD. Now, another concept that's coming to the fore is this concept of frailty. And frailty in, in general is a, it's a physical state where one doesn't have the physiologic reserve to withstand some stressor to the system. It could be an illness, it could be an injury, it could be a TAVR, which is the reason why it got accelerated in, in the cardiology literature. 
but also it affects patients with heart failure. And those patients who are frail can be defined by a number of different systems. The one that I typically rely upon is the Freed Frailty Index. I'm sure many of you have heard of this. But basically, it looks for slowness, weakness, weight loss, low activity, and exhaustion. And we can measure these through either semi-quantitative or qualitative measures. And those patients who have four or five of these criteria are considered to be frail and are at particularly high risk for uh, mortality. Now, I had a very pleasant talk just a few minutes ago talking about the importance of going to the bedside and the importance of physical examination. And I can't stress that enough. And for those residents, fellows, uh, even some of my early career attendings who work with me know that one of the things I love to do is to go to the bedside and measure the jugular venous pressure. And one of the reasons why I like to do this is because it's a window on the heart. I can go to the bedside, look at the neck, and I can see by the jugular venous pressure, I, I, I can directly measure or indirectly measure the pressure in the right atrium. If I take that pressure and I double it, that gives me the wedge pressure. And if I double that, I get the PA systolic pressure. Now, the correlation coefficient to do that is, is pretty good. It's not perfect, but for quick and dirty hemodynamic assessment, just going to the bedside, I can tell those patients who are congested versus those patients who aren't congested. And it's this concept of congestion that we now know is the thing that propels the heart failure syndrome. This was shown very beautifully by Mark Drasner, who's now chief of cardiology down at UT Southwestern. Uh, he did this while he was at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Just look at two physical exam findings, jugular venous pressure, and the presence or absence of an S3 gallop. And he was able to show that those patients who had either one of these had an increased mortality mm -hmm. over the next year or two compared to those patients who didn't have that at the time that they presented for evaluation. Also from the Brigham and Women's is a, a nice study by Michelle Kittleson showing the um, adverse outcomes for those patients who were not able to tolerate those neurohormonal antagonists either due to a, a lack of blood pressure or due to worsening renal function. Here you can see that those patients who were able to be maintained on an ACE inhibitor following their discharge from hospital for decompensated heart failure had a reasonable survival, but those patients who had to come off the ACE inhibitor or God forbid had to come off an ACE inhibitor and be treated with the ninotropes had really adverse survival. And this also extends to beta blockers, which are probably as a class, the, the best class of medicines that we have to treat patients with chronic heart failure. You can see that if you had to withdraw a beta blocker or if those patients were discharged without ever being started on a beta blocker, their survival over the next three months was much worse than those patients who continued or had a beta blocker started. Now, there are some more sophisticated ways that we can try to assess prognosis, and one is through the use of cardiopulmonary exercise testing. For those of you who watched the Olympics, you probably saw some of the Olympic athletes in their training center doing the exact same thing. This is called a, a cardiopulmonary stress test, or CPET. It's done with a metabolic cart that measures in, inspired and expired oxygen and carbon dioxide. From that, we can measure something called VO2, or the consumption of oxygen with exercise. It's a very elegant study, a seminal study in our field uh, that was conducted by my colleague and my mentor, Dr. Donna Mancini, when she was at the University of Pennsylvania. She was trying to figure out when, when should we send patients for heart transplant? When are you sick enough to actually benefit from a heart transplant? And so she decided to draw a line in the sand and said, for those patients who have a peak oxygen consumption of less than 14, we're going to go ahead and evaluate you for transplant. If you have a peak VO2 of greater than 14, we're going to see you back and just follow you closely. And so in green are those patients who had a peak VO2 of greater than 14. You can see that their survival was actually quite good over the next two years and at the time was better than what was being achieved with heart transplantation. And those patients in blue and red were those patients who were, who were um, uh, either listed for transplant or turned down for transplant and followed. And you can see that their survival was much worse. So that was done over 20 years ago. Uh, working with Keith Aronson, Dr. Mancini uh, used a multivariate score to refine, the, uh, to refine cardiopulmonary oxygen testing a little bit more a little bit more and came up with this seven point scale, the heart failure survival score. It's a multivariate scale. Um, there are weighted coefficients. And the things that they look at are the presence or absence of coronary artery disease, your resting heart rate, your resting ejection fraction, your mean arterial blood pressure, the presence or absence of intraventricular conduction delay on your surface cardiogram, your measured peak VO2 and your serum sodium. Now, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but all of these are independent predictors or univariate predictors of outcome in, in heart failure. But if you do this heart failure survival score, you can then calculate 
and predict whether someone is in a low-risk group, a medium-risk group, or a high-risk group. And um, this was done back in 1997, quite a long time ago. And this study predated the widespread use of beta blockers, predated the use of ICDs for primary prevention, cardiac resynchronization, and uh, the use of aldosterone antagonists. So what they did at Columbia a few years ago was to take a contemporary cohort of patients with heart failure, and they simply repeated the heart failure survival score. And what they showed is that the heart failure survival score still performed well. It was able to have very good discriminatory ability, could segregate people into a low-risk group, a medium-risk group, and a high-risk group. And if you look at the survival in those patients who were in the low-risk group, it was as good as transplant. So it's now recommended that for patients who have a heart failure survival score that places them in that medium or high risk uh, group, that they should be considered for heart transplantation. Now that requires you to do uh, a test, an exercise, a cardiopulmonary exercise test, which is not widely available. A different multivariable model is the Seattle heart failure score. And this was generated um, based upon a number of clinical trials in heart failure. And from that, they came up with a a uh, derivation cohort. It was subsequently um, validated in a prospective cohort and is now available online. I put the URL down at the bottom of the slide. But using very simple clinical uh, criteria that we measure on all of our patients, we can use this to anticipate what the survival is going to be over the next several years. Now, like most models, it tends to tail off in performance at the extreme. So patients who are really, really sick, it overestimates their mortality. And for patients who are, all right, let me say that again, for people who are really, really well, it overestimates their mortality. And for patients who are really, really sick, like stage D heart failure, it tends to make their survival look a little bit better than it is. Now, they're going back and they're tweaking the model a little bit to see if they can refine it. But nonetheless, the, the characteristics of the model are actually quite good. So if you were to look at the behind the computer screen and see how the Seattle heart failure model works, it basically assigns a score, a weighted score, and you can see that it does a very good job discriminating uh, based upon the score. It can segregate patients into several different uh, quartiles or quintiles um, with their uh, anticipated survival stratified there. So it's now recommended by our guidelines, um, a 2B recommendation, which means that you may do it. It doesn't strongly recommend that have to do it, that we should use uh, heart failure prognosis scores along with cardiopulmonary stress tests to determine prognosis and also to use that as a criteria to determine whether or not someone would benefit from transplantation or benefit from a lifelong uh, a VAD. Class three is to just rely upon these scoring systems, and I think that recommendation highlights the fact that they're good, but they're not perfect. So if we look at the, the guidelines for recommendations about advanced heart failure therapies, they're a lot thinner than the recommendations that we have for HEFREF. And in fact, if we look a little bit more closely, you'll see that the one therapy that is recommended as level of evidence A, I'm sorry, as a, a, a class one recommendation, um, but only by consensus, is uh, heart transplantation. MCS, mechanical circulatory support devices, LVADs, are 2A, which means that it is uh, uh, beneficial in, in most populations, and you can see that there are a number of clinical trials uh, supporting that, and I'll walk you through those. So this is a, a, a really important time for those of us who practice transplant medicine because the first human heart transplant was performed just over 50 years ago. Uh, that honor goes to Dr. Christian Barnard, who in 1967, in December of 1967, performed the human, first human heart transplant. I always mention the second person because, you know, it's like, who is the second person to land on the moon? And everyone, I don't know. You know, whoever gets their second, you never know. So I have to give um, a shout out to uh, Dr. Adrian Kantrowitz. Um, he performed the second human heart transplant, the first in the United States. And it's important for two reasons. One is because it happened in Brooklyn. So he is a, uh, was a New Yorker, so New Yorkers can be proud of that fact. And the second thing is that Dr. Kantrowitz is probably better well-known for the gentleman who invented the intraortic balloon pump. And odds are that you will use his device at some point in your training, both house staff and for those who go into cardiology, will certainly put your hands on a balloon pump, and we owe that to Dr. Kantrowitz. But probably the, the person who is most responsible for heart transplantation is Dr. Kantrowitz, who uh, was really the pioneer and he and his group at Stanford uh, persevered uh, throughout the 1960s, 1970s, for 
uh, perfecting not only the surgical technique, but the biopsy technique that allows us to screen for rejection, and also the medical therapy that is so critically important to the success of heart transplantation. So this is volume over time, starting in 1982. And I didn't include the slide that, that shows the volume of transplants starting in 1967, and that's because it's microscopic. What happened in 1982 is the fact that cyclosporin was approved. And once you had a technological breakthrough, effective immune suppression, survival started to improve. And when survival began to improve, heart transplantation moved from being a medical curiosity to being mainstream and to accepted therapy. And look what happened to the volumes. Overnight, the volume of heart transplant in North America and in the United States, which is shaded in, in, um, in green, exploded. And it accelerated very, very rapidly. So there was a, a rapid acceptance of this therapy. The problem, and I'll touch upon this in, in a minute, is that the majority of this slide shows that those numbers are static. And they've remained static up until the last couple of years, where we've seen an uptick. The sad thing about that uptick is that it's not that we're doing a better job accepting organs or managing patients with heart failure. It's an uptick because of the opioid crisis. And so although I like the fact that more patients are receiving heart transplants, it's a little note of sadness because we recognize that the patients or the, the persons who are donating those hearts are dying uh, at a very young age because of uh, addiction. Well, the good news is that heart transplant survival has continued to improve over the decades. You can see here um, the survival over time, uh, stratified by different eras. And in the current era, we haven't even reached the, the median survival yet. Now median survival is thought to be over 11 years for all comers, with um, you know, the idea of long-term survival now being uh, the, the rule rather than the exception. So survivors 20, 25, 30, even 35 years have certainly occurred in those patients who are adolescents or young adults when they receive their transplant. Nonetheless, there is a need to innovate, and there are a couple of ways that we can innovate. One is uh, through the use of an organ care system. This is basically a glorified Langendorf, which allows the heart to be perfused with uh, warm blood um, while it is being transported. In, in addition to being able to preserve the heart in such a way, we're also able to sample um, the blood that's circulating, and we can measure lactate levels. And if those lactate levels are rising, we know that this heart's going to struggle and fail, and that would be a heart that we could discard. Um, not only does this allow us to extend our geographic reach, it may also open up a new set of donors to us. And these are DCD donors, or donors after um, circulatory death. And I'll show you that in a minute. This is just uh, one, one snapshot of a, uh, the Transmedics organ care system, looking at those patients who um, underwent transplant with an organ that was supported by the device versus those that were receiving standard care. And, in that case, it's like packed on ice, stuck in an igloo cooler, and flown for two hours you know, across the United States. That's sort of the, the standard of care right now, uh, showing that the survival out to two years is the same between these two. But I think it's this, this idea, this concept of, of donation after circulatory death, where one is brought to the operating room, they are removed from the ventilator, and you wait uh, a period of time to see whether or not they experience a cardiac arrest at which point the organs are harvested. And then generally it's not a good idea to wait until the heart has had a cardiac arrest and then transplant that heart. But if we can take that heart, put it on this organ care system, resuscitate the organ and sample blood over time to make sure that it's not developing an acidosis, we may be able to use those hearts. So shown here is the, uh, the Papworth experience in England, looking at about 25 um, donors after uh, brain death and those who DCD donors, and you can see that the post-transplant survival of the recipients was identical, extending out over the first year. Now, the long-term consequences of this, we'll have to find out, you know, are, is this a heart that's going to last, instead of a median survival 11 years, maybe it'll only be three or five years. We also don't know if these hearts are more prone to antibody-mediated rejection. We also don't know if these hearts are more prone to the development of cardiac allograft vasculopathy, which is one of the Achilles heels of transplantation. So more to come at that. The other innovation is on the diagnostic side. Um, every time that you do an organ transplant, you're actually doing a genome transplant. So the genome that is, exists in the heart is different than that of the recipient. And we know that there is a certain amount of, of DNA turnover that one can sample from the bloodstream at any point in time. We all have it. We all have our own DNA freely circulating in our bloodstream. What's very interesting is that you can, you can 
do a blood sample and measure the amount of circulating free DNA. And the relative uh, relationship, the proportion of donor-derived cell-free DNA over recipient DNA is very constant over time. And if you see an increase in donor-derived cell-free DNA, you know that the allograft is being injured. It doesn't tell you why it's being injured. It could be due to infection. It could be due to rejection. It could be due to graft vasculopathy and coronary ischemia. But in the right time frame, we can really focus on the most likely uh, cause being rejection. So here's an example of uh, three patients who had uh, their levels of donor-derived cell-free DNA drawn over time. Um, in the upper left-hand panel, you can see what happens in early on after transplant in those first couple of weeks. The proportion of donor-derived cell-free DNA is very high because the heart has you know, experienced some injury due to cold ischemia and warm ischemia time. But it then quickly decays and goes down to a, a very constant level over the next year or so. And here's an example of someone who had that pattern. And then about one year to you know, 14 months after transplant, the levels of donor-derived cell-free DNA went up. And this turned out to be associated with significant allograft rejection. They were appropriately treated, and you can see that the levels came right back down to baseline. The other thing that we're beginning to recognize is that rejection just doesn't come out of the blue. In fact, it probably smolders for a while before it reaches and develops clinical symptoms. We now recognize that if you draw donor-derived cell-free DNA over time, you can begin to see a slight rise and uptick in donor-derived cell-free DNA, and now we can predict that that patient is going to go on to develop rejection. It also gives us a window of opportunity to try to prevent that rejection episode so they don't experience all of the consequences that come with uh, acute rejection. We were talking about population-based statistics a little while ago. There are about 200,000 patients right now who are living with heart transplants. Uh, <laughs> I wish. 200,000 patients living with advanced heart failure. There are about 2,000 heart transplants performed per year which means that heart transplantation meets about 1% of the demand. Um, as some people have said, um, this is uh, the cure for advanced heart failure um, with a heart transplant is like trying to cure poverty with the lottery. It's just never going to happen. So because of that discrepancy between the, the need and the availability, what we're seeing a rise in that space are machines, particularly this type of machine, which is a left ventricular assist device. Over the last several decades, there has been an evolution of these devices from the first generation pumps, which were these large volume displacement pumps that had a pusher plate. They were loud, they were large, and they were not durable. The real revolution occurred back in 2007 when the, and 2008 when the FDA approved the HeartMate 2. This is a continuous flow pump. It's small, it's durable, it's quiet. And with that, we had a technological breakthrough, and we saw the volume of implants uh, improve. Additionally, there are new uh, third generation or centrifugal flow pumps that have been approved, the Hardware HVAD and the Abbott HeartMate 3. So this is how these pumps work. Essentially, they're a tube. They're a tube that connects the LV apex to the aorta. And in the middle of that tube is a pump. It's a, uh, either a spinning, uh, a spinning impeller or a rotating disc that uh, accelerates the blood and creates uh, pressure behind it. In the case of the HeartMate 2, this is an axial flow pump. The flow of blood is along the long axis of the impeller. It spins around 9,000, 10,000 revolutions per minute. can generate flows anywhere between 3 and 9 liters per minute. Uh, this is the Hardware HVAD. It's a centrifugal flow pump. Um, it has a rotating disc. It spins around uh, 3,000 revolutions per minute. can generate identical blood flow to the HeartMate 2. The difference between these two pumps uh, lies not only in the mechanism by which they move the blood, but also their location. The HeartMate 2 requires a subdiaphragmatic preperitoneal implant, um, whereas the uh, Hardware HVAD is completely contained within the pericardial space without the need to violate the diaphragm. The newest comer to this uh, market is the HeartMate 3 left ventricular assist system. Just like the Hardware HVAD, it is a spinning disc, a centrifugal pump, um, but it has uh, three design features which are unique. The first, it has very wide blood flow passages, the gap between the housing and the disc, and that decreases the amount of shear stress that the blood experiences. The second thing is completely frictionless. It doesn't have those contact bearings. And the third thing is that it has built within the computer software an intrinsic pulse. 
So every two seconds, what happens is that the device will power down, slow down a little bit, and then it will accelerate back up, and then it will drop back down to its baseline speed. And the reason for doing that is to disrupt any areas of stasis that might be developing within the pump housing to kind of wash that area out and prevent areas of stasis and pump thrombosis. <clears throat> there are several indications, too, really, for um, uh, durable MCS, bridge to transplant, where you have someone who's on a transplant waiting list, but you don't think they're going to survive long enough to get a transplant, and destination therapy or lifelong therapy, where you use the LVAD and transplant. And these pumps have been able to demonstrate excellent survival over the midterm. One-year survival is now just over 80%. Two-year survival is around 70%. Three-year survival is around 60%. When we put these pumps in, we really think of them as sort of a three- to five-year solution to advanced heart failure. And over that period of time, we see sustained improvements in functional capacity and quality of life. Uh, this is the volume of implants over time. I'll just draw your attention to 2013. And the reason is because in 2013, there were more than 2,000 LVADs implanted. It was the first time that there were more mechanical circulatory support devices implanted than there were transplants performed. And as you can see, this trend continues to move upward. We're not quite at the 100,000 implants per year, but we are getting closer to around 4,000 implants per year. Now, the second thing that might become apparent in this is the fact that the gray bars are the area that where we see the greatest growth. And this is the use of an LVAD for destination therapy or for lifelong therapy as an alternative to a transplant. So if we're going to be using LVAD to patients as an alternative to transplant, we're going to be putting them into older patients. And so the question is, is there an age limit? So this is one of my patients. I can't give you his actual age, but I can tell you he's in his mid to late 70s. Um, and he's doing this with the LVAD, which you can kind of see bulging in his, in his shirt. And he, he showed me this video. I asked him if I could have his permission to use it. He said, sure. He's like, well, what do you think of my golf swing? And I said, I think you need to spend more time on the range. But nonetheless, uh, it's pretty cool. So we do know that there is an interaction between, um, between a, a recipient's age and their subsequent outcome after receiving an LVAD. In general, people who are younger do better than patients who are older. But if we drill so we see that risk is not defined just by age, but there's an interaction between age and how sick you are when you go into the operating room. Um, we use something called the Intermax profiles. Uh, in general, Intermax profile one and two means that you're in cardiogenic shock. These are really sick patients who are in the ICU, who are unstable on escalating doses of inotropes, or who are receiving mechanical, temporary mechanical circulatory support devices. Patients who are level three through seven are basically clinically stable on or off of inotropes. But you can see that for a 65-year-old person, if you go into the operating room compensated, you're a probability of death by one year is around 10, 15%. But if you go in uh, unstable, it's now increasing to 20, 25%. And that it goes up to 30, 40% once you get closer to 80 years of age. So if we were to take the example of my patient, um, if he went into the operating room clinically stable at age 75, he has about a 20% mortality risk. However, if he went in in cardiogenic shock, it's now 30 to 40%. Um, obviously, we did not send him for uh, this therapy when he was really, really sick. We waited for the sweet spot where he was compensated on inotropes. There you go. Okay. So that's the good news. Improves survival, improves functional capacity. Now here's the reality, and that is that the burden that these patients experience in terms of adverse events is quite heavy. So if you look at event-free survival, or survival free of an adverse event, you can see that only 30% of patients are alive at one year without having experienced death, infection, bleeding, device malfunction, or stroke. And so where a lot of the focus has been in the last several years is how can we find a way to develop a pump, engineer a pump that is more biocompatible and less likely to lead to these adverse events. So some of you may remember this um, report that was published in the world's uh, most read medical journal called the New York Times. Um, this was published at Thanksgiving. Uh, 2013. And I remember it because it ruined my Thanksgiving. Because even though I had known for years that there was a lot of talk amongst our community that we were seeing this uh, problem arise 
uh, it was new to our hospital administrators and to our patients. And I got flooded with phone calls over that Thanksgiving holiday. What they were reporting on is this, and this was that in 2012 and, and subsequent years, we saw this sudden and dramatic increase in pump thrombosis uh, reported by three large volume uh, implant centers, the Cleveland Clinic, Duke, and Barnes Jewish Hospital, part of Washington University. Um, and people wanted to know why. <clears throat> Um, this is what we were seeing. This is a, a buildup of, of fiber and deposition at the inflow contact bearing of the HeartMate 2. And once this um, fiber and deposition started, it continued to spread to the rotor assembly and could cause the pump to uh, hemolyze blood and then to shut down. When you look at this clot under uh, a microscope, what you see is that you have this densely, densely packed layers of fibrin. Um, and sometimes on top of it, you can see this more loosely packed uh, fresh thrombus on top of this uh, more densely packed thrombus. Um, so most of the pump thrombosis that occurred in the HeartMate 2 was occurring uh, de novo on that inflow contact bearing. But we also know that there are patients with advanced heart failure who have clots in the left atrial appendage and the left ventricle, and these can get sucked down into the pump as well. This is a, a more recent case report published in January of a clot that got sucked into a HeartMate 3. And once it got sucked down and contained in the, the, in the uh, pump housing, it began to spread until it eventually just grew so much like the blob that it caused the pump to completely shut down. Thrombus can occur uh, at several different key uh, points along the, the blood flow path. It can occur in the uh, inflow cannula. It can occur within the pump housing itself, or it can accumulate and build up in the outflow graft. And we have different ways of trying to tease out where the pump thrombus is. We follow this algorithm. I'm not going to walk you through this, essentially just to say that we do have an algorithm to approach patients who have pump thrombosis. And one of the real clues for us is an increase in LDH and also the presence of darkening urine, Coca-Cola urine, uh, for hemolysis. <clears throat> this is just one case that, that we were associated with at Mount Sinai Hospital. There had been these reports of using thrombolytics to break up a clot. We thought, hey, that's great. This was our patient who was a gentleman who received a pump to bridge him to uh, candidacy because he had active hepatitis C virus. And so the hope was we'd put this pump in, treat him for hep C, and then uh, make him. This was before the use of Harvonian agents like that. And he uh, eventually got treated with interferon, but he developed a pump thrombus. And you can appreciate here, here's a pigtail catheter, which we're putting near the, um, in the LV apex, near the inflow cannula and directly infusing TPA in the hope of breaking up that clot. Uh, we were really pleased because it worked. Uh, this clot went away, the aortic valve closed, the pump flow increased, and we were giving each other high fives that we felt that we just pulled this guy uh, out of the jaws of defeat. Until three days later when his LDH rose, his uh, pump flows uh, dropped, and he went back into uh, critical cardiogenic shock and went for an urgent pump exchange. And this is what we found when we took the pump out. Here is a, a thrombus blocking one of the main blood flow passages in the heart mate too. And I don't know how well it projects, but essentially this area here is just basically fused onto the pump like it was uh, heated up and, and, and densely, densely adherent to the pump. But here you see this more gelatinous appearing fresh thrombus. And I think what happened was he had one of these fresh thrombus, we gave TPA, that went away, but we were left with it still this really raw thrombogenic surface, and he was just intermittently clotting and clotting and clotting. And this was the first and the last case of pump thrombosis that we treated with thrombolytics. When we now have pump thrombosis, we surgically explant the pump. So all this is, in a sense, a, a bit of prologue into the need to bioengineer a pump that can avoid the side effect of pump thrombosis. And at the ACC, just a few days ago, this was the uh, long-term cohort of the HeartMate 3 trial called Momentum 3. Um, just for disclosure, we were a, a participating center uh, in this trial. <clears throat> that we reported on outcomes, uh, two-year outcomes for the long-term cohort, 366 patients randomized to receive either the HeartMate 2 or the HeartMate 3. And this is the primary endpoint, uh, looking at survival uh, at two years, free of pump exchange and free of pump uh, and free of pump thrombosis or stroke. And you can see that the HeartMate 3 group had about a 78% survival free of those adverse events and the HeartMate 2 group only 56%. When we look at what drove that endpoint, it was completely driven on pump thrombosis and the need to replace the pump. 
um, which was much more prevalent uh, in the HeartMate 2 and the HeartMate 3. In fact, there are only three pump exchanges in the HeartMate 3, one for infection, one for an electrical fault, and one for a twisted outflow graft. So if these pumps are so good, should we be putting them into less sick patients? And so in general, there's been a trend over the years to move away from implanting in critically cardiogenic shock patients into more clinically stable patients. And that's highlighted here that we're now putting them into more patients who are Intermax Profile 3 stable on an inotrope rather than those patients who are in cardiogenic shock. But there's been little change in those patients who are Intermax Level 4 through 7, clinically stable, not inotrope dependent, but still very symptomatic. And I think one of the reasons is because of this just concept of downshifting risk, which is, you know, if you're going to put a pump into someone who's in cardiogenic shock, you know that they may die after the pump and they face a higher mortality, but they have 100% mortality if you don't put it in. So if their one-year survival is 60 70% with the pump and zero without it, you're going to put the pump in. So you can show that the magnitude of benefit, the magnitude of the treatment benefits, really quite significant. But if you have someone who has a pretty good one or two year survival and you put a pump in, you might make it incrementally better, but is it worth exposing them to those adverse events for a small bump up in survival? And so what's really important is we need to know, well, what would happen in those less sick patients who are still, by the way, very, very sick if we were to just continue to treat them medically? So in patients who are Intermax profile four through seven, so that means Intermax four means you're short of breath at rest, Five means you can't leave your house. Six means you can't walk you know, half a block. And seven is advanced class three heart failure. You can see that half of them, more than half are dead in a year. So those patients that you see in front of you who you think are stable, they're not stable. And the way to treat them is to go back to what I said in the beginning of the talk, which is initiate and escalate ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, RNAs, and aldosterone antagonists. And understand that you're, that person who's sitting in front of you may look stable, but they're actually at high risk of dying. So... Uh, so this is what would happen if they didn't receive a pump. But if we break this out into the, the Intermax Profile 4, symptomatic at rest, versus those patients who are Intermax Profile 7, 6, 7, which means that they're pretty functionally limited, but they're not short of breath at rest, you can see that the adverse survival is really coming from those patients who either are symptomatic at rest or can't leave their house uh, or can't uh, walk half a block rather than those who can walk a block or more. So is it worth it? So the roadmap trial basically took 200 patients who were eligible for, uh, for an LVAD who were not dependent on an inotrope and asked them, do you want to have an LVAD or do you want to continue medical therapy? And they left it up to the patients and providers. So it's an observational study. Uh, about 100 in each arm. We now have two-year outcomes. And if we look at the intention to treat analysis, you can see that the one-year and two-year survival in these two groups is exactly the same. And that's by intention to treat. And the reason why the survival looks better in the medically treated arm is that there was a significant crossover, that many of those patients went on to receive LVADs, and that's why their survival is better. If we were to look at actuarial survival, in fact, there is a big treatment difference. So by two years, the number of patients who were alive on original therapy, um, in, in that case for an LVAD, it means you're alive two years later on the LVAD without a pump exchange or urgent explant or urgent transplant was 70%, you opted for medical therapy, and what was the probability of you being alive two years later without needing a delayed LVAD or a transplant? It's only 41%. So there clearly is a survival advantage with early implantation of ventricular assist devices. So one question is, if you are a person who's inclined to not want to go for surgery, and if you want to continue on medical therapy, and then subsequently wait until the very last minute to receive your LVAD, do you pay a price for that? In other words, are you going to increase your chance of dying? And at least on the basis of the roadmap study, the answer is no, because if we focus again on intent to treat survival, one in two years is, is no different. There's no hazard associated with that. Um, there are gains, though, if you go for an LVAD. The first is that most patients who received an LVAD had significant improvements in their functional capacity. Um, they also had improvements in their quality. There were um, adverse events. The most common is bleeding, particularly gastrointestinal bleeding, pump thrombosis, stroke, arrhythmias, worsening heart failure. All of those were more common in patients who received a VAD. But I think it's important to look at the impact of health-related quality of life. I told you this was observational. We left it up to the patients and providers to choose. And what's really interesting is to really get into the psychology of why one person chose one therapy over the other. 
And in general, what we know is that the patients who are eligible for VAD who had a very, very poor quality of life, they wanted to feel better and they went for the LVAD. The patients who, who felt like they were doing okay chose not to receive the LVAD. And if we were to stratify survival based upon their baseline health-related quality of life, you can see that those patients who were more symptomatic actually fared worse with either therapy over time. So now we've come to this, which is an integrated approach to decision-making. If you're Intermax Profile 1, 2, or 3, even I would argue Intermax Profile 4, you should get an LVAD. If you're Intermax Profile 5, 6, or 7, if your quality of life is poor, if you don't like the fact that your survival is a 50-50 of one year, then go ahead and, and uh, go forward with the LVAD, and we will do everything we can to mitigate the risks of an adverse event. So in summary, uh, guideline-directed medical therapy improves survival, but it's underutilized. Advanced heart failure can be defined by an inability to sustain guideline-directed medical therapy due to cardiorenal limitations, recurrent hospitalization, or worsening functional status. Heart transplantation is the gold standard. It will remain the gold standard, at least for a little while longer, um, until we have that, uh, the next technological breakthrough. And lifelong LVAD therapy is becoming a reality due to improvements in device technology. So thank you again for inviting me to be with you today. It's really been a great pleasure and be happy to answer any questions you might have. I'm curious to hear you talk a little bit more about the, the initial point you made, and then also in the summary, just our um, struggles with treatment or adequately and the patient factors of that, and also the physician factors of that. Yeah, it's a great point. I, I think there are both patient and physician factors. On the patient side, you know, if, if when I tell my patients I want to increase your medicines, they, they panic. Well, why? You know, I thought I was doing okay. And I have to take the time to educate them. Like, no, this is a good thing. If, if you're stable, that's when I want to increase the medicines. When you're unstable is when I decrease the medicines. And I, I try to tell them it's, it's counterintuitive. And that usually helps to realize some of the, the fears. The second is on the provider side. I, I think on the provider side, there are two things which are operative. The, the first is just an underappreciation of how sick these patients are. If you look a little bit more closely at those survival curves, it's pretty easy to determine that survival with heart failure is worse than survival with cancer. And unless you have like stage four pancreatic cancer or stage four lung cancer, there is no survival with cancer that is, that is worse than having stage D heart failure. And yet it doesn't set the house on fire. And if we were to go and just take one step you know, earlier than that, stage three heart failure, class three heart failure, patients don't, or providers don't really understand like, look, the, the clock is ticking. And that person who looks stable really isn't stable. And so you have to increase the doses of medicines. So I think that the theme that, that I've tried to develop and what we're trying to do at the health system level is to build best practice alerts into EPIC, um, to build an outpatient pathway that will just boil it down to the simple question, which is, which medicine did you start today? Which medicine did you increase today? If not, why not? like three questions, just to be a prompt to say, hey, no, this is what we need to be doing. You need to be escalating the therapy because the situation that you have in front of you is really unstable. The second, I think, is a misunderstanding about how to interpret labs in these patients. Um, the things that, that I struggle with is that, you know, ACE inhibitors, ARNs, ARBs, they increase creatinine, but they improve survival. And so there is no absolute creatinine where you have to stop these medicines. And so if the creatinine goes from 1.3 to 1.7 on an, an ACE or an ARNI, I'll take it because I know that patient survival is improving. If the potassium goes from 4.8 to 5.2, I'll take it. And it's just a, a, having just wider tolerance around some of these medicines, understanding that these are the things that are really going to keep people alive. So those are the, the behavioral challenges and educational opportunities. Great, great, great. Question. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm just wondering how you how you determine the bronchus's presence. 
it's a real practice. Yeah, it, it's challenging because you can't image a thrombus, particularly yeah. if it's inside a, a metal housing. Uh, so we look at a couple things. Um, the, the best example are, are those thrombi that occur on an impeller or on a, a rotor. And that's because the only thing that we can change on the pump is, is the pump speed. And the pump speed should require a certain amount of energy to maintain that pump speed. And when that amount of energy goes up really high, that means that there's something wrong with the pump. And usually when that goes up, it's, it's a sign of uh, pump thrombosis with it being on the, on the, uh, on the, the impeller or on the motor itself. <clears throat> the second thing is the presence of, of hemolysis. And the third is the presence of heart failure symptoms. Now it gets a little bit more confusing, um, but kind of interesting too. If you have, and I always do this as a thought experiment, I unfairly pick on cardiology fellows. I'm like, okay, take a clamp and start to clamp the outflow graph and tell me what happens to your pump power. I'm sure if you're thinking about this in the audience, you're like, well, pump power will go up. In reality, pump power goes down. And that's because the amount of power that the pump consumes is directly related to the amount of work that it has to do. Work, as you remember, is force over distance. So if you stop in this case, what, the, what you're moving is fluid over distance. If you decrease the amount of fluid that you're moving by clamping the outflow, your pump power will actually go down because the amount of work goes down. It's also the reason why the pump power goes up when it has a thrombus because the amount of work goes up. Um, <clears throat> and so we have to kind of tease that out um, using some of the parameters that we get from the pump and also some of the hemodynamics that we measure and also some echo imaging too. If the, the thing that we use the most is something called an echo ramp test, where we take the pump, we, we power it all the way down, and then we start to power it up, and we see, can we decongest, can we unload the heart? If the pump's working normally, as you ramp up the speed, you should be able to suck all the blood out of the heart, because that's how powerful these pumps are. So you should see a, a decrease in your left ventricular filling, so left ventricular diameter. You should also see the aortic valve close, because there's no stroke volume going out the aortic valve. And so as you, as you turn the pump up, those things should happen. If they don't happen, it's usually a sign that you've got a, an obstruction somewhere.